Um, okay, so we're going to just start the session and let people float in. My name is Hannah Poole, and I'm a journalist and the curator of the talks and debates here at the Africa Utopia Festival. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, we've got a really exciting program throughout the whole day, and one of the things that I have been most excited about is the session that we're about to start, which is um, the keynote and the in conversation with uh, one of my personal heroes <laughs> or heroines, um, Edna Adan. I met Edna um, earlier this year at a conference at the New Africa Forum in Gabon, and the conference was, was good on many levels, but it was row after row after row of men speaking. And Edna was on the platform, um, but probably one of the most powerful moments of the conference was when Edna gave um, a provocation from the floor. Um, and it was kind of after that that I was just determined to get her to come and speak in London. I'm really pleased. So thank you very much for coming. I know you've had a very long journey. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Edna's going to, in a few minutes, going to give a, uh, going to say, uh, talk for about 10 minutes about the work that she does. Then we're going to do a quick interview, and then there will be plenty of time afterwards for audience Q and A. So um, Edna is uh, a woman of many firsts, I think. Uh, she was the first person in Somaliland to publicly stand up against FGM as a member of the World Health Organization, foreign minister and the only woman minister of Somaliland. Uh, she was also the former first lady of Somaliland and the first, present, the first person to represent Somaliland in the UN. Um, and according to this, the first person in Somaliland to drive a car. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. Um, and later still, um, Edna sold uh, that car <laughs> to, uh, to fulfill the dream of building Somaliland's first maternity hospital, which opened in 2002, and is now on a mission to train uh, a thousand fully qualified midwives across Somaliland and a million midwives for Africa. Um, Edna is a tireless campaigner and an incredibly engaging speaker and all-round powerhouse. Her campaign and the way that she goes about it also speaks to me very personally because my own mother died in childbirth. And so as a fellow East African woman, I'm really, really honored to have Edna here to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much. I, I, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. And it's quite ironic, almost 60 years to the day, I was here at the Royal Festival Hall as a student uh, selling programs for a charity. And little did I know that 60 years later I'd be here with you know, great people like you speaking about my life. Because at that time, I didn't know what kind of a life I was going to have. I was here to study nursing, and my whole life and my ambition was just to become a nurse. That was the extent of my ambition. But then opportunities present themselves. And I graduated, specialized in midwifery, found the great passion of my life, delivering babies, and uh, went home in 1961 as the first qualified nurse midwife. That was just after my country had become independent. Uh, it was former British Somaliland protectorate. It was part of the great big British Empire, which I hope will not become splintered. Um, none of my business. I take that back. Uh, and then I realized that what we were lacking in my country was trained health professionals. Uh, I was trained at the Hammersmith Hospital, Lewisham Hospital, great hospitals in the United Kingdom where everything was in place, expertise was available. If complications uh, presented themselves, there was always a solution. There was always somebody higher up to refer people to. And when I went home, I was, as the Americans say, where the buck stopped. A woman had a problem, they brought it to me. Uh, a woman was bleeding, they brought it to me. She needed C-sections, she was brought to me. And I thought, I'm not trained for this. I'm a nurse, I'm a midwife, I cannot do a cesarean section. But what I could do was train as many more midwives as I could, pass on to them the skills that had been taught to me. Um, things progress, you get married, opportunities, careers, the United Nations, diplomatic services, you know, the boutiques and the duty-free <laughs> privileges and all the things that come with it. You know, the, the uh, you know, first class travel, sometimes even, you know, uh, 
Air Force One, presidential, you know, president, presidential uh, aircrafts, United States. And, uh, and then my country went to war because we had united with our neighboring country, Somalia, went to war to try and regain our own self-determination. And I think you have a picture here in the background, which is one of the reasons why I went home after I retired. That shows the picture of a hospital that was bombed in a civil war. Now, who bombs hospitals? Who bombs schools? Who bombs civilian dwellings? I guess people who go to war do that. Um, at that time, I was a, a very uh, senior diplomat with WHO, based in Djibouti uh, from 91 to 97, at a time when the Horn of Africa was going through a lot of turmoil, a lot of changes. Uh, there, were, there was a war in Ethiopia, Eritrea, there was a war across the Red Sea from Djibouti in Yemen, there was war in Djibouti itself, and then of course there was a big war in Somalia and between Somalia and Somaliland. Uh, as a senior UN diplomat, I was sent to Somaliland to assess the situation, and this is what I found. And I thought, oh my God, here I am worrying about what color, what, you know, what make a watch I'm going to buy, or what make of a car I'm going to have, and how many cylinders does it have, and this is how my people live. My people had no water, the country had no food. The country was thrown with landmines. A lot of war victims, a lot of human remains were still visible. Uh, a lot of tanks, armored vehicles, cannons, heavy equipment, expensive equipment. And I thought, oh my God, I cannot turn away. I cannot go too far away from this. But what could I do? The problems were many, and I thought, I will concentrate on the one thing I know what to do about. I will concentrate on the health of women and children. I'm a midwife. I know what to do when, for a woman who's pregnant. I know how to get that baby out. I know how to take care of that baby, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. I will build a hospital that will give a safe place for women to come and have their babies. That was really, in fact, the sum total of my ambition at that time. So in 1997, when I retired, and I cashed in my terminal benefits, my repatriation grant, sold all the things that I had no need for, what am I going to do with a with a washing machine in a country that has no electricity? What am I going to do with a microwave? What am I going to do with, a, with so many of the trinkets that I had and surrounded myself with when the country I was going to had no roads, had no nothing to, to um, make me use all those things that I had surrounded myself with. So I just recycled my whole life just recycled everything I had into cold cash and went home. And got out of my air-conditioned car, my air-conditioned offices, I left my very vast and efficient UN staff and set myself up under the shade of a tree and started to build a hospital. I applied for one, which of course I said, well, why do you want to build a hospital? You can't build a hospital. Why, why do you, well, what makes you want to do that? And I said, well, if you were a country that had hospitals, then I wouldn't be coming here to build one. But since you do not have hospitals, and you do not have a maternity hospital, be grateful that there is one crazy old woman who wants to do one for you. Um, so that's how it started. We. Um, I was given a land that had once been a killing ground, that had once been a cemetery, that had once been a military parade ground, that had once known all kinds of human injustice. 
And at first I thought, come on, you can, I can build a hospital on a site that's so, you know, that has such a, you know, gruesome and morbid past. I want to give you a hospital. A hospital should be clean and white and sterile. And, and you want to give me a, a, a garbage dump because that's what it eventually had become. And the answer was, that's the only land we have for you. So if you want to build a hospital, that's what we can give you. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with this mountain of garbage? What am I going to do with... So they said, well, okay, we'll, we'll bulldoze it for you and we'll cut it away, and, uh, which is what the government did. 32 truckloads of garbage were hauled away from that land and God sent the rains and today I live on it and I wouldn't be anywhere else. That's where I live. I visit here, I visit world capitals, but that's where I really live. Broke the ground, started to build a hospital, it took four years, and I, my office was, as I said, the shade of a tree, and then somebody took pity on me and said, well, yeah, come on, you can't keep moving your, your, your seat from one shade, one side of the tree to the other. So they built a little hut for me with cardboard boxes and uh, that's, that was my office. And that's where I held court. And that's where I discussed construction with my, with my construction crew. And that's where the foreman came and, and um, talked to me about you know, the, how many kilos of nails he needed and how many uh, planks of wood and how many millimeter uh, iron bars he needed, and I learned so much about construction. Four years later, the hospital was completed. Today, that hospital is a teaching hospital. Today, we also have a university that is two years old. I know I'm crazy, but then that's, that's my passion. And my passion, of course, is to try and pass on my example to others. And if I can teach others the, um, what you can do with your determination, an old woman at 60, retired, going back to Somaliland, a war-torn country, and to build a hospital, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. Today, I have some of my young graduates are teaching. And I just sit in the background, and it brings tears to my eyes because one of the surgeons in my hospital today, who's operating and who's putting shunts into the, uh, into the heads of little children born with hydrocephalus, is a young nurse, among the first nurses I trained there, who I almost kicked out because she was so small and she was so young and I kept saying, oh my God, Oh, let her come back in three years, four years' time. You know, there's nothing I can do with this child. <laughs> She's too young. Let her grow. And the, my staff were saying, but she got good grades. She passed the entrance exam. And I said, well, come on, she'll, she'll pass the entrance exam again in three years' time, in four years' time. Let her grow up. Let her come back. And sometimes you say, thank God I was wrong because somehow I said, okay, all right, I give in, but she won't last. She did. She graduated among the top five of the class three years later. She stayed on to do midwifery and again remained among the top tiers and then went to do medical, went to medical school and became one of the first female doctors in Somaliland. Today, that little girl who I almost kicked out of my training school, is a surgeon. Aren't you glad you're wrong sometimes? <laughs> what we do is, what I try to do is I try to leave with my people the gift of knowledge, the gift of hope, the gift of determination, perseverance, and looking for something to improve. Look around and say, okay, this is working well. Can we make it work even better? Aim for excellence. Aim for perfection. Aim to inspire others. That's the gift I want to leave behind. It's not that beautiful Mercedes, and every time I see a beautiful Mercedes, oh God, I used to have one of those. 
But I want to be surrounded by people like Dr. Shukri, who I say, thank God for people like her, because she is making a difference in the lives of so many and such a role model. I don't know how I'm doing with the time I'm given, but I could talk forever about my hospital. So what I'm going to do is I'll have Chris over there to show you a series of pictures that will take you to uh, breaking the ground of the hospital, laying the foundation, and building, and building, and building the completed hospital, and then some of the uh, students who graduated from that hospital. Today, there are over a couple of hundred midwives in Somaliland who are so efficient. But my aim, as Hannah said, is to train 1,000 midwives. Because the few who we have trained remain in big cities. But what about the women in villages? What about the women in places where there are no roads? What about the women who are in, in towns where there are no hospitals? And if Somaliland can do it, anybody can do it. And if God and his grace gives me time and life, that's the ambition I have set myself. Maybe some would say, I've set myself an ambition to have a million dollars. I'd like a million midwives. And before I can get there, I would also like a dozen school teachers to come and help me teach. Because knowledge is the biggest gift and the most precious gift we can leave for our people. I would be happy to, uh, I think you've run through the pictures. And I think we'll follow that up with the real passion, training, teaching. These are some of my staff, some of my nurses, uh, some of my midwives. And we can show the others. That's among the first group of trainees. And Dr. Shukri is among one of the girls there. And the girls in red are the community midwives. These are the ones I would like to spread out uh, throughout the country. And of course, we now have graduates from the university who have Bachelor of Science degrees. And we do not discriminate against boys because <laughs> we also need nurses because now we have male, ma male patients as well. We have pharmacists and lab technicians and doctors. And of course, a sick person needs a health professional, whether it's a man or a woman. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is baby number one. Little Mr. Harir, who's 14 years old now, and whose ambition is to become a, a, a medical doctor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Edna. Um, that's incredible. Um, can you just say a little bit more about why midwives specifically, and um, how many lives, for example, you would estimate would be saved by better equipped medical and particularly maternal health care? Well, midwives, because I'm a midwife. If I were a carpenter, I'd be setting, making tables or whatever, but I'm a midwife. And Africa, and particularly Somaliland, has one of the world's highest maternal mortality rates in the world. Women are dying of causes that no woman should die of. Women are dying of infections related to their childbirth. Women are dying of hemorrhage. Women are dying of obstructed labor. Women are dying of eclampsia. No woman in this day and age should die of eclampsia because we do have tools and the skills to identify and see which pregnant woman uh, has a blood pressure that is rising above the normal. And we have the skills and the knowledge to be able to manage that rising blood pressure in this pregnant woman. But women in countries like mine do not have that. And that's why we have the world's highest maternal mortality rate. With skilled birth attendants, we can save 60%. We can address 60 or 70% of the complications, complications associated with pregnancy. Um, women who attend uh, prenatal care or are seen by a midwife during pregnancy can have many of their problems corrected before they go to full term if they're anemic, 
their anemia is corrected. If that woman has a contracted pelvis, a woman, a person who is a midwife will advise her about not trying to have that baby the normal way because that woman would need a cesarean section. So the sooner she goes to a place where a cesarean section would be available, the better. Not wait until the last minute when she's obstructed and the baby's died and she's bleeding and her uterus is rupturing and you start looking for where do we take her. That's not a solution. The solution is getting that woman to a place where she can be helped when she needs help in good time. Now with midwives and my hospital, I mean we have, we have an operating theater, we have a blood bank, we have a, a resident doctor 24 hours a day. And by the way, it's not only a maternity hospital, it's a general hospital. Um, we have been able to reduce maternal mortality of the Somali woman, which was supposed to be 1,600, 1,600 per 100,000 live births, to less than 40. That's one quarter of the maternal mortality rate of the Somali woman has been reduced by just having trained health professionals and the ability to respond to an emergency when the, when the emergency arises. So that was, that, that's, that's why we're, we're training midwives and that's why we wish to train as many midwives as we can. Um, I'll give you an example of the, the kind of problems we see and I don't want to scare you away who's coming to volunteer with us. Uh, be prepared to see a woman brought to you who delivered five days ago and who still has a placenta inside her. Five days, not five hours, five days, and she lived. You try dealing with women who've had obstructed labor, and the baby's been sitting there at the door, not being able to come out for five or six days. The baby is dead, of course, but in the meantime, it has also destroyed the urethra, a passage for the urine. And a hole develops there that makes that woman develop a fistula. And a fistula is one of the things you never want to see ever. A woman who's not able to control her urine. We wouldn't be sitting here if our urine were leaking. We'd be dripping all over the place. We'd be smelling. We'd be ostracized. We'd be sent to a little hut as far away as the family as possible. You don't want to see that. But then if you do not have proper maternity care, that's the result you see. You don't want to see a woman who's, who has a transverse lie with a prolapsed arm, and the only person that woman had to deliver her was her nine-year-old child. And with the prolapsed arm, all the mother could say to her nine-year-old daughter is, pull, pull. And you pull, you know what happens. The arm comes off. That's gruesome. But that's the reality. And it's not why these things are happening. It's what can we do about these things. And Every day in my life, I say, thank God. I just celebrated my 77th birthday. And it's only, <laughs> it's when I see a woman like that survive, or a woman with a fistula heal and go home dry, then I say my life has been worth living. Not because of all the trinkets I've had in the past, I, you know, I go down the little market and I get something for two pounds. It shines just as much. So what? So what? I said, that's what life is all about. And if I can inspire others to come home and share whatever skills you have with your people, I think this world would be a better place. There's so many trying to destroy this poor little planet. 
there's got to be a few determined ones to try and do something about it. Let's become the fixers. Let's become the healers. Let's become the ones who solve problems, not cause problems. But we have a long way to go in childcare. We have a long, long way to go. And that's something that's waiting for the next generation. If I can... Um, uh, my little hospital, it's, it's small. We have, I think, three of the only premature baby incubators in the country. Now, when I was training at the Hammersmith, if I told them then, if, if somebody had put three babies in the same incubator, they would have been shot at dawn. But we have to do that, because I have three babies and I have one incubator, so it's either putting them all three together and hoping for the best, or putting two of them on the street. Um, very often we do what we can, and as best as we can. The moral of the story is doing it the best way you can. It reminds me of that little story, may I? You may, of course. <laughs> that little hummingbird. There's a forest fire. There's a little fire starting somewhere in the corner of the forest. And as soon as the smoke is seen, the lions run away, the elephants run away, the hippos, the um, rhinos, the giraffes, the monkeys, the everything, you know, they, they run away in the opposite direction. And a couple of <coughs> hundred yards down, there's a little river. And there's a little hummingbird that's flying to the little river picking up a few drops of blood, uh, of water, and dropping it, and back, and dropping it on the fire, fire and dropping it. And the lions and the elephants laugh. Come on, hummingbird, you cannot put a fire out with those few drops of water you carry in your beak. And the hummingbird said, maybe not, but at least I'm not running away, and I'm doing my best. So it's the story of that hummingbird. We try to do our best. It's not going to put all the fire out. It's not going to solve all the problems of Africa. But at least a few drops from many beaks will solve some of our problems. Beautiful place to end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.